Hi guys, um, this is Rohit Sharma again and uh, in this short lecture we are going to go through um, the PyTorch, how do you get started with PyTorch and in the content uh, we will cover two short topics, PyTorch basics, um, like any other language, high level language, uh, it has variables, tensors and stuff so we will go through them and number two we will take up an example problem, very simple one of uh, linear regression and will show you how do you um, create the data set, take that data set, uh, create a network, a simple network of one layer and take PyTorch through the training and create the model, do the model evaluation and the save the model. So that's the second part. <clears throat> so let's get right into it. Um, the first thing you do is you import PyTorch and this is done by using import torch, right? You see in the cell, there's nothing magical there. Uh, the first thing, um, the most basic unit of PyTorch is PyTorch tensors uh, and they are multidimensional matrices containing elements of a single data type like int, float, um, short or 16-bit integers and strings and so on, right? So Torch defines 10 different types of uh, these tensors for CPU and GPU variants. Um, and most common type of PyTorch tensor is float tensor and it is declared as follows, x equals torch.float tensor and then you provide a list of lists. So this is a Python list of lists that Torch API float tensor is taking in and it is two row and three columns. Uh, so the shape or the size of the uh, tensor is uh, two rows and three columns. And in the next line, I'm just printing the content of that. So when you execute that, you can clearly see uh, it's a torch tensor of size two by three and with the contents that we passed in Python list of lists. So this is what you would do and then there are like several other methods, int tensor, short tensor and so on and so forth. Um, you can look through the PyTorch manual to find more about those. So that is the most basic uh, unit uh, and that 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 is pervasive through the PyTorch operations, networks and everything that you talk about. So uh, that's how you create a tensor in PyTorch. Now, what do you do with those tensors, right? I mean, the the most basic um, fundamental of a deep learning or a machine learning framework is to be able to allow these um, basic units to be operated on. And those operations are mostly mathematical. Uh, a basic linear algebraic system uh, mostly dictates as to what uh, these tensors are used for. So you can add them, subtract them, multiply them, some unary operators, some binary operators, some ternary operators, and then more complex operators. Um, and in this context, um, layers and operators are one and the same thing. Uh, from the language or compiler point of view, we call them operators. And from the deep learning or data science point of view, we call them layers. So PyTorch contains many mathematical operations over tensors and they run in hundreds unlike high level languages for example you know Python or Java or JavaScript they have a bunch like less than 20 but in a deep learning or a machine learning framework uh, these operators are the core uh, of the framework and so there are several hundreds of those for example, Onyx uh, has over 170 operators as of now um, and so you can expect something similar in PyTorch and, uh, and TensorFlow and the number is going up by the day. So how do you use those? Um, there are syntactic sugars but the underlying methods for these operators um, are actually on the tensors so you can call a method called underscore add underscore so if you want to add two operators um, you can call it x dot add underscore this is your method and then you can supply the right hand side um, of that which is um, 
uh, in this case I'm actually adding um, ones of the size of two by three right so X calls an add operator and this is another way of adding two tensors so these two tensors are um, of two by three and each one of them has one so the resulting would be a matrix of two rows and three column with element two in each and then I'm adding that to the original uh, matrix of X which is one two three four five six and you would add two in each one of these elements so that becomes three four five six seven eight and that is the result that you see so this is how you would do operations x dot add underscore or simply you know python like a plus b kind of operation and the same thing goes with subtraction and uh, multiplication addition um, um, division and modulus and so on so some of the basic ones and then you can add on top like logarithmic, uh, trigonometric functions, um, sine, cos, theta, um, uh, tangent, um, and you know, hyperbolic functions, and some of the more complex ones that you can think of in the basic algebra, trigonometry, and then there are more complex ones like um, uh, convolutions, max pool, uh, LSTMs, GRU, and, and so on. Those are also operators. So it, it builds on top of these simple ones. Um, so this is what you, this is how you do um, PyTorch operations with uh, PyTorch tensors. Um, and the next section is on NumPy. Now NumPy is very important to, to data scientists and anybody who plays with numbers. And the most modern frameworks, they have interoperability uh, between NumPy and the framework. So that is uh, good and actually desired because before these frameworks showed up, most of the data scientists were experimenting and working in NumPy for their work. So uh, the the older code and um, you know uh, the 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 past software that were written were using NumPy have good interoperability between frameworks in NumPy, and uh, a good framework should allow. Uh, uh, easy back and forth between the framework and NumPy and this is true for PyTorch. PyTorch has made it very easy to go back and forth from NumPy to PyTorch, Tensor and you know back. And so how do you do that? Um, it's simple. Uh, in this next uh, cell what you see is um, you import the NumPy and uh, we are creating two matrices Y and Z. And this is again uh, a three row and two columns each. The first one is default data type, which is float, and the second one is of integer 16, which is also called short. So you, you create um, the NumPy matrices like this, and if you want to uh, sort of use those NumPy uh, ND array, um, you can you will have to convert them from NumPy. So Torch has provided a, a method called Torch dot from NumPy, and you can pass any array or ND array from NumPy, and then it will convert that NumPy to Torch tensor. Um, and so the next sentence you see is x dot short uh, and decorator symbol at torch dot from numpy and this is just a syntactic sugar for uh, matrix multiplication you could easily say x dot short which converts the x um, tensor from the float data type to short data type and the second one is um, takes a z and d array um, and converts that to torch tensor so this is done using torch dot from numpy uh, and you should experiment that this sentence is nothing but a syntactic sugar for mul matrix multiplication. And this is same as torch.matmul if you were to pass x.short and torch.fromNumpyz to both of these. So this is how you go back and forth from NumPy. And uh, they have adopted quite a few pytorch has adopted quite a few uh, you know useful methods from numpy and one of them and my personal favorite is view 
which is in the next cell. So it takes a tensor and creates a view off of that. Now, this is similar to reshape in some ways and very different in another, other ways. Um, on the surface, it looks like it's a reshape and all it does is it, uh, it changes the uh, shape of the tensor. But it's much deeper than that. Um, in NumPy, you can create a view or a slice um, and not have to go through the underlying data. Um, meaning you're not copying anything, you're using the same underlying data that is present in the memory. And so view tensor actually shares the same underlying data with, with its base tensor. So if you change anything in the view tensor, you're changing the base tensor. And supporting view avoids explicit data copy for a fast and memory efficient reshaping, slicing, and element-wise operations. So if you are um, uh, concerned about efficiency, this is the method that you should be looking at. But it's more for advanced users. For simpler basic examples, you would not need to use that. And uh, so this is where this is where we end uh, the section on PyTorch and NumPy. And if you have more questions, here is a useful GitHub repo that outlines PyTorch, PyTorch to NumPy conversions. And you can go through that link and you will find um, a good examples as to how, it, how do you go back and forth. The next section is very useful for people who uh, would like to use CPUs and GPUs. Now PyTorch natively supports heterogeneous computing and it has made it very simple. Um, and in ways that PyTorch allows you your variables to change device on the fly. So you can create a tensor in the CPU and after checking whether your um, computer has uh, a GPU or not, you can create the variable on GPU also. So it natively supports CPUs and GPUs and by simply you know, calling methods on the variables will bring the variable to a, another device. So for example, in this example, I'm creating a variable called float tensor, which by default, it would create on the host device, which is by default CPU. And by the way, your laptop and even your cell phone generally have a GPU, which is a, a supporting device. Um, the main device is still CPU, CPU controls everything, um, and GPU is a support where, support device where anything heavyweight and more uh, matrix-related computation happens on GPUs. So um, the X creates float tensor on CPU, and the Y is NumPy matrix uh, with the data type of float32, and that is also created on CPUs. Now, let's say we want to bring um, X and Y um, on um, GPU, and we want to do a uh, operation of, let's say, X plus Y. Now, matrix operations, like I said, in, on GPU, they are very efficient. And the way you would do is, first you will check if GPU is available, then uh, you, you would want to check if torch.cuda is available. CUDA is an interface, it's a heterogeneous uh, um, standard for heterogeneous device, devices. So uh, it is supported and originated at uh, uh, NVIDIA. It's for parallel compute. Um, so torch.cuda is available, tells you whether you have a GPU or any other you know, accelerator in your uh, computer, like uh, your laptop, your tablet, or your cell phone. And so x is equal to x dot cuda brings that variable to gpu y is equal to torch dot from numpy dot cuda brings that again from cpu to gpu and converts that to a torch tensor on gpu and then you can say z is equal to x plus y and so what that means is you are simply adding these two variables in the gpu and then you can print add um, print the addition z and you can bring that back to CPU by saying x dot CPU or z dot CPU. And why is that useful? Is because 
these accelerators mostly support SCUDA and then there are a lot of complex and very compute demanding operations like um, convolution which would take um, you know minutes to hours where a GPU can you know finish the job in a matter of seconds so they are you know many order of magnitude faster than CPU um, the most of the time is spent in this operation for bringing the data from the disk to the RAM and to one of the devices. So CPU or GPU, that also takes several milliseconds of time depending on how big the data is. Uh, it, it can take up to several seconds um, in every operation. So you, one must be careful as to where do you create these variables. Now this is again is kind of for intermediate um, programmers, but I just thought that this is such a cool feature that PyTorch has introduced and made so easy. I just wanted to bring it to your attention. Now, PyTorch variables. Now, these variables are somewhat different from tensors, and think of them uh, as, a, as a wrapped um, layer around tensors. So it's like a super class, if you would, in just like in Java. Uh, underlying um, methods that uh, variable has they come most of them come from um, tensors PyTorch tensors and it supports almost all the APIs defined by tensors um, variable in PyTorch is cleverly defined as part of autograd autograd package um, an autograd package is uh, used for finding the gradient of every function um, and it's a package autograd is a package which lets you um, uh, you let it which gives you the gradient of the functions that are defined in higher level languages with respect to a variable and so the variable is needed to find that gradient when you use the autograd package and PyTorch has cleverly defined um, that as part of autograd package, not PyTorch native. And so the variables, which are essentially graph nodes, and all graph nodes must be differentiable uh, for deep learning. And we'll discuss as to why that is uh, in the coming lecture. But for now, take my word that variables are graph nodes that must be differentiable. And they are thin wrappers around tensors that have dependency knowledge uh, meaning uh, one function can be differentiated with respect to certain variables and those variables must be declared as PyTorch variables otherwise you can't use autograd package and that is needed for backward propagation um, so variable enables back propagation of gradients and automatic differentiation and uh, generally volatile for inferencing um, so the way you create these variables is by declaring um, the by using uh, the torch dot autograd dot variable class and you create objects. So we will import from torch dot autograd import variable and then we are creating two variables. Um, v one is equal to variable torch dot tensor one two three which requires that no it doesn't need it. So we are saying autograd is false. We don't need autograd um, functionality in v1. And we are saying we need it for v2. So our require autograd is true. Now we can do v1 star v2, which is a multiplication of v1 and v2, uh, essentially a matrix uh, or a vector multiplication of 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, 6. And then we can um, bring it to uh, numpy. So v3.data.numpy or v3.item.numpy will convert uh, that uh, variable to a numpy and array, which is 1 times 4 is 4, uh, 2 times 5 is 10, and 3 times 6 is 18. So it will be 4, 10, 18, which is the result of your v times dot v2. So this is how you um, create PyTorch variables. Now let's move to back propagation. We will cover the theory in the next lecture, but for now, briefly, why we need back propagation is when a network is created, uh, the forward propagation happens 
using the functionality of those node and layers. For example, if you have a gem operator, which is W times X plus B, and you are propagating X, W and B are model parameters, which are being trained currently. So what you would do in that operator, take weights, which is W, multiply that with X and add B on top, and that's your output. Um, and you forward propagate these through several layers, uh, depending on the network. It might be convolution, max pool, relu, um, jam, flatten, and so on and so forth. So you simply compute and do forward propagation through that layer, through those layers using the functionality. Now, once you reach the output of the network, um, the network output might not match the ground truth, and that's where you start computing the error and the error gradient. Now, backward propagation is an algorithm which takes those error gradients and distributes them throughout the network. If you have an error equal to, for example, 80%, you would want to know where this error is coming from. So it assigns those uh, fractions or parts of that whole error to different layers and different uh, weights and biases and other model parameters. And why is that needed? Because in the optimization algorithm, you need some kind of a slope to predict and estimate the next value of weights and biases and model parameters so that you can reduce the error in the next iteration. And these iterations continue and the optimization algorithm along with backward propagation would optimize this network to be able to generalize the underlying, generalize and learn the underlying patterns present in the input data. So like I said, we will go through these two algorithms again in the next uh, future lectures, but for now it's needed that backpropagation, um, the functions of backpropagation must be differentiable with respect to the graph nodes and variables to find error gradients on each node. So that's what the grad uh, backward propagation does, right? So, so we have established two things, right? Variables are needed and with the gradient with the true. Um, so we have gone through, you know, creating creation of variable multiple times. So the X is nothing but a variable and Y is a sign of X. So, and we are saying Y dot backward, meaning it's going to give us the compute, the error gradient of the node Y. And this is how you, cal you this is how you call backward propagation algorithm on one tensor. So it will continue to go backward until it finds the inputs or the variables, right? Um, so um, now in this case, uh, because y was sin x, right? And uh, gradient of sin x is cos x. So y is equal to cos x using symbolic algebra. And x is sin x, right? And now we are checking here in this condition that all the um, values that are present in the variable uh, tensor x um, are actually indeed uh, cos x of that, right? So y is cos of x. And that's what we did in when we said y is equal to torch of, torch of sin x the gradient would be cos x. So this, this line is actually checking that condition actually holds good. And if it does, then we are printing d dy dx of sin x is equal to cos x, which is out, output of this cell. So it was just a minor testing on our part. We wanted to find out if the grad is actually doing um, the computing the gradient with respect to the variable x or not. And we found that it was true indeed. So this is uh, as far as the basics go on the PyTorch. And there are a lot of examples and tutorials that I would like you to go through. The second uh, bullet is uh, has a lot of tutorials, 
but you must build on the foundation of these variables, tensors, operations, and conversion to numpy, um, and variables. Um, backward propagation and heterogeneous computing, you will have to probably get some experience before you start to sort of get a hang of those. If you don't, it's fine. Continue going, build an example. So that is a good segue for our next section, PyTorch example problem. And in this, we are going to sort of create the data set, very simple data set that we can experiment and play around and see if PyTorch is working the way it works, uh, you know, find the quirks if we are planning to use it for future because if you start to create larger network, um, it's difficult to debug some of those easy ones that you can do with the simpler networks. So in this example, we're going to create a very simple classical machine learning algorithm of simple linear regression. And what that is, is essentially, we're going to say y is equal to mx plus b, a simple line, and add some noise that, on that data. And in data science language, we call it y is equal to w times x plus b. So let's get started, right? So, so we call it SLR, simple linear regression. The step one is we synthesize the data set. So we are just creating the data set out of thin air. Um, and we know that we're going to create that from the equation y is equal to mx plus b or w times x plus b. And we would inject a little bit of a random error. And the next cell actually does that. So this is just a boilerplate code which makes it deterministic. We're not worried about that. Now create the data set. So we are saying w is equal to t2 and b is equal to 3. Feel free to you know change this, play it around and suit your need. Um, you know, you won't, I promise you won't break anything by changing these. The next line is x is equal to np dot space. This is a numpy function which gives you um, 100 samples from 0 to 10. So we have a vector of 100 elements with values ranging from 0 to 10. And now we are we are saying y is equal to w times x plus b. So it's the same line that we thought we we're going to create the data set with. So data set is nothing but x and y values. And this is a regression problem. So the output would be continuous. The model will produce a continuous output. And for that we are we are actually giving the data set of x and y values, all the input variables and the output values. So output values would be w times x plus b. And this is injecting the random error. And what this is, is np.random.randn, and it's giving us 100 different values between 0 and 1. And we are simply squaring that. So we are multiplying that with 2, sorry. So um, it's essentially w times x plus b. And so if you see b is 3, w is 2, the maximum value is 10. For x, maximum value for random error is 2. And so the maximum value of y would be 10 times 2 plus 3 plus 2, which is 20 plus 3 plus 2 is 25. And the, the minimum value would be 0. Given x is 0, uh, minimum value would be 3, I believe, because b is 3. Right, so minimum value is 3. Um, so that's that. Um, now, we have created x and y here, and then now we are reshaping this, those two um, you know, matrices. And the reason we need to give minus 1, minus 1 is actually unknown, meaning um, you are essentially saying to PyTorch that, oh, I don't know the number, why don't you compute according to the shape inference algorithm that is inside on some of these operators and algorithms. So think of that as an unknown variable n whenever you give minus n. So this is unknown. Um, and uh, so minus one is chosen as an unknown variable. So this is how we have created the data set. Now we have the data set 
we are going to plot it and just see if we have created something similar to a line or it's something else. So this is a boilerplate code from matlab.pyplot and it's showing all the points that the data set has created, right? So these dot cross, uh, the red crosses that you see on this plot uh, with x axis going from 0 to 10 because this is what we said, you know, in lin space 0, 10, 100 samples, this is what this is. And the y value is w times x plus b plus some error, random error. And so this is what that random error is. If we remove the random error, then it'll be a straight line. So let, let's let's give and see if we can show you um, the values without that. So we computed, it's got fine. And let's see, yes, yes. so now you see it's, it's an exact line. Now we're going back and putting the error again and uh, here again. So this is, what our data set with the error looks like. Um, now, I would like to remind you that the model, the real model should be around a line because in reality, when you are collecting the data and creating a data set, expect the error coming from different sources in real life. You never get the exact, um, you know, curve that you're looking for. Um, so that's where the machine learning is good for. So we have created the data set in the step one. Now step two, we are going to create a linear regression model. And this is similar how you would create a network. Think of this as a network with one layer, uh, if you will. So this is how you create the class. It's a very simple class and you got to pass a super um, class torch dot nn dot module um, and this would initialize certain things in PyTorch. For now, we're not going to worry about that. And you definitely need two more two two uh, methods in this class. One is init, the second one is forward. And this is your forward propagation, meaning whenever you give it a new x value, it propagates through the network and gives you the y prediction. Right, and in the init, we are initializing the model, which is nothing but a linear model. Essentially, we are saying, oh, we have a data set we, that we think will fit into a linear model. And we are giving the input and output dimensions of that, right? And this is passed in the init. And so we, when we create the linear regression model of, um, this class, an object of this class, we need to pass input dimensions and output dimension. That becomes a requirement, right? Okay, so this is how you would create a network. Um, and that's a deep learning model. In this case, just one layer. Calling it a deep learning model would be a mistake. It's not, but let's pretend this is our network of one layer, right? Um, so the next line model equals linear regression model in dimension one or dimension one is creates the object of that class linear regression model. So this is our model. Remember, if you've gone through the Keras lecture in tf.keras, uh, we created the model using uh, tf.keras.sequential and there were a lot of layers that we were adding. Uh, it was just one line. In PyTorch, it's slightly more verbose. It's a, it's a slightly lower, it's not a high level API, it's a lower level framework, just like TensorFlow. And um, uh, not TensorFlow Keras. TensorFlow Keras is a high level API, but both of them are easy enough to use. So now that we have created the network, the next step is training the model. And we need few things before we can train it. Uh, we need cost and the optimizer. So for regression, the popular cost method to use is MSC loss. Um, and we'll talk about MSC loss in the upcoming lectures. Um, and the optimizer, you have choices in Keras. I think we ended up using ADAM optimizer. In this case, we are going to go with stochastic gradient descent. And that is available via Torch APIs, torch.optim.sgd. And 
It takes model dot parameters, a learning rate, which we are initializing to 0 0.01, and a momentum of 0 0.9. These are actually the variables of the SGT uh, algorithms. They have their default. So if you are starting afresh, you can ignore them. They are not required. So with the cost and optimizer defined, we need variables that we can pass through the network. And we already created our X and Y. All we need to do is to convert those X and Y tensors from tensors to variables. So remember, we had those earlier here, right? Um, in, the, in, the, in the graph that we talked about. And those were NumPy ND arrays. Now we're converting those NumPy ND arrays to torch tensors and variables. And we have gone through all of this, uh, you know, in the section one. So if you have any confusion, go visit section one. How do you create the, uh, uh, how do you convert the NumPy ND arrays to torch uh, tensors and a torch tensor to a variable? So we are creating inputs and outputs for the network. And now coming to this part, which is nothing but training. So this is a loop. And in Keras, this, for this, we just simply said model.fit. And it model.fit had this, this loop that we are showing you here. So it's slightly more verbose, but it's easy enough to understand. The first thing you do in this loop is you do a forward pass, meaning you take the inputs and you pass them through the model, which was our linear regression model that we created here. And this does a forward pass. And forward pass would call this function. And it will continue to call this function on every layer. We have only one for the simplicity. So it returns you the Y prediction of the model here. And then you would want to find out once the outputs are calculated, are they good enough? And for that, you would want to compute the error or the loss, which is our MSE loss. So you say, what, well, what is the error? So you run that through the cost function, which is MSE loss. And you say, my ground truth was outputs and my prediction is Y prad. Give me the cost vector or the loss vector that resulted out of this forward pass. And for the first one in the range that you're going through, the first epoch would have a large error in the large loss. And we pass this loss and pass it to optimizer and say, this is our gradient, compute the gradient um, on the optimizer. And optimizer has these model parameters that are passed to it already, right? So it, it goes and looks at every function and does a, a gradient computation on each function with respect to those variables, correct? Now, once we have those error gradients, then we say, well, we found out the error and we have error gradient. Now let's find the error on each one of these parameters. And the loss dot backward does exactly that. We are finding the error on each one of these um, nodes of the graph, every element in the node of the graph. Once we have that, we are ready for the next pass. But before that, we need to find what is the next step for the optimizer. Like every weight and bias and rest of the parameters, what is the best estimate that it can take? And uh, again, we would go through that you know, algorithm in our next lectures. But for now, it's preparing for the next Ws and next uh, Bs, weights and biases for the next forward pass, which would be part of the next loop. So this is the one. And this time it would make a better prediction because we know there was an error and that will try, it has tried reducing that error. So this entire loop is nothing but it goes through the forward pass, computes the error, and then it estimates the Bates and biases so that in the next iteration, it is, it is the error is reduced the loss is reduced and that's all it is doing, right? So that's the, that's the loop. And at the end, we are printing um, at every 10th epoch, what is that loss? And if everything is in order, we should see that the loss continues to go down. 
So when we run it, if you see the output of this cell, um, epoch 10, 20, 30, 40, and 100, there is, a, there is um, the loss kind of has this tendency to go down. In some cases, it'll go up, and that's instability that you'll see. And if you see that, you will have to tune some of the hyperparameters. So in this case, it goes from 18 to 6 and then goes back up 10. And this is essentially is reflecting your training is slightly unstable. I would not worry about that at this point. And if you are, then go, go ahead and play around with that learning rate. Uh, make it 0 0.01 instead of um, 0 0.001 instead of 1 and see how that changes. Right. Um, and I'm leaving that as an assignment for you guys to see if you want to see a monotonically decreasing loss, play, play with this parameter and see how that changes your algorithm. Um, so now our model is trained. Uh, in the step four, uh, we would uh, evaluate this model and see how this is working out. So remember, we only created the training set. We did not create the test set. Um, and so let's create the test set. But one very important thing that you have to do is to put this model into evaluation mode. And what that does is it is disables certain functions and parameters that are required for backward propagation. When you are evaluating, you don't need backward propagation. You only need forward pass. You only need forward propagation. So this is a magical line without explaining it too much. It's, I, let me just say that you need this for the um, evaluation mode. So once you do that, we create the test X and test Y similar to we created train X and train Y. Um, and now we have five variables, uh, a vector of five elements that we can pass to this model and find out the prediction, right? So the way you uh, evaluate the model is using just calling and passing the input test x and you know assigning that to prediction y. So this is your prediction test y. Actually, we should call it prediction. Let me change it right now. Pred y. Pred y. And this is what this is. That's all there is. So now prediction y gives you the model prediction and uh, tx is essentially your input now it should come very close and when we run this we see ground truth is 3, three and the model prediction was 3.42 there is some error um, and that's what the error is because there was um, a randomized noise that was introduced between um, minus 2 to 2 and so it's trying to find a balance so there would be some error and if you if you would like to make it closer to you know um, uh, zero, the error between ground truth and model prediction, go play with that um, uh, random error part that we introduced early in the uh, notebook. So let's see where it is. This is right here. So instead of multiplying it by two, if you reduce it by you know say 0.1, then you will see more or less you know this band, the width of this this data goes um, in, a, in, in a straighter line. And in that, your machine learning model will catch and then your error will reduce. And again, I'm leaving that as an assignment for you guys to play around. So this is how you would evaluate and this is the error. Now we have done our work of evaluating. The last step is just to save the model. But before that, let's visually inspect. And again, I'm not going to go through this code it's a simple code that we have seen before in the cells. It's plotting the same data set and also plotting the model, which is just a line at this point. And so if you see, this is, this is what the additional line is to plot the model in addition to the data set uh, printing. And so this is model and data set, and we see this line is kind of representing all the points and in, is in fact linear. And in the end, you save the model and save it for further inference or the next step of your machine learning pipeline. Um, so that's, that's the lecture. Uh, I hope you guys learned something new. Um, 
with this let me stop here and before i leave you guys make sure that you go through this for the reading this is a article um that sort of outlines this notebook and also make sure if you're planning to use pytorch make sure you go through some of these tutorials that are listed here with that thank you so much bye now